Fellas, we have seen some massive changes with our raw loot pool. Now, up until this season, it was virtually impossible to farm for these, let alone even get a single drop of some of these weapons. Like, literally, the raw loot became the rarest loot in the game. Literally, for the entirety of Season of the Witch, we got three Psy Hermetics, and one of them was from the Gunsmith. But luckily, this season, it is easier than ever to finally get these weapons. Best of all, the raw loot pool is free for all players. So today, we're going to be going over all the changes that have happened to our raw loot pool this season. We're going to be talking about the best ways to get gunsmith ingrams and then focus for raw loot at Banshee. Then we're going to talk about the best way to get the new raw loot from this year. And then lastly, we're going to talk about each of these weapons, which ones you should be going for, and my recommended gun rolls for each of them. By the way, if you have not checked out our season of the wish weapons, our dreaming city weapons, how to get them very, very fast, and the god rolls for all of them, there will be links down below in the description that will take you to those videos. Now, starting out with our raw loot revamp. Now, pretty much every system behind hunting for these elusive weapons has been altered. Previously, if you wanted a specific weapon that was part of the raw loot pool, you either randomly opened Gunsmith Ingrams, which came at a snail's pace, waited for the weapon to pop up in Banshee's inventory, or you won the lottery. Really, like the RNG lottery in Destiny. The rarest of the rare was our raw loot pool drops. Now, starting in Season of the Wish, these previous methods are still present, but we have new methods of acquiring our desired weapons. Now, these are Gunsmith focusing and new lost sector rewards. Now, our first method, gunsmith focusing, is the big one here, as you can finally choose exactly what weapon you want to get a roll of. Now, you can't choose from every weapon as the focusing will be split up by each foundry, and currently, there are only four to choose from, with more being added in future seasons. Now, these foundries will be on a rotation inside of Banji's inventory, where two of them will be available for focusing each day, and on daily resets, one will rotate out for a new one, which means every foundry gets two days at Banji's before needing to rotate back in. Now, as for the cost, for one weapon, it will cost you three gunsmith ingrams and 5,000 glimmer. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, that's way too many ingrams. And before this season, you would be right. But now, there are some new methods and farms that will net you gunsmith ingrams very quickly, which we'll cover in just a minute. Now, for the second method of acquiring rural loot weapons, Lost Sectors will now be a guaranteed source for rural loot. And this is actually the place you want to be if your weapon is is not featured within Banshee's Foundry Focusing. However, this is a disclaimer that new weapons added to the Rural Loot Pool this season are not featured here and unfortunately can still only be acquired through random Ingrams, but will be available here next season. I know. Don't worry, guys. It's not like it's the longest season in Destiny history or anything. We'll be there before you know it. But for the weapons that are in rotation right now, this is actually great, guys. These weapons rotate just like exotic armor rotates every day, with it being four weapons out of 16 available within the Lost Sector's loot pool with each rotation. Now, there is a set rotation, meaning you can plan out which days you want to farm, which takes us to our loot schedule. That's right, guys. This is a loot schedule for those of you that are looking to know when each weapon is available across both Gunsmith Focusing and Lost Sectors. Now, this is the schedule, guys. Again, this is from the beginning of the season for like the next seven months. But let me just give you the rotation. It always starts with Amelon and Suros on day one. Then Suros and Hake on day two, Hockey and Vice on day three, and then Vice and Amelon on day four. And then it just rotates and repeats. And that's how it's going to be literally this entire season. We even have a calendar here, which can kind of give you a breakdown of what you're looking at. Now, getting into the weapons themselves. For Suros, we have Cantata, Syncopation, Fugu, Staccato, Pizzicato, Furatura, Hockey. We have Palmyra, Perseus D, Ragnahill, Inya, Bodica, and Lodbrok. Vice, we have Crates, Redback, Funnel Web, Luna Lada, Tape In, and Jiraka and for Amelon, we have Snorri, Typhon, Ogma, Galu, Amit, and R. Vandale. Now that you know the rotation and the weapons that you can get there with the gunsmith, though, you've got an idea there, guys, when you want to go and grab that loot from Banshee. Now, let's talk about the rotation and weapons within low sectors, as that's really where you want to farm the most, guys, because there's lots of benefits that we're going to get into in just a moment. Again, just like the loot there with the gunsmith, this repeatedly keeps rotating. For day one, we have Nox Perennial, Old Sterling, Marcelin, Sununa. For day two, we have Sire Hermetic, Lissanda, Eru Kanji, and Nasreddin. I know I'm killing these names, guys. Bear with me. Day three, we have Heliocentric, Last Foray, Hand in Hand, and Battle Scar. With day four, we have Geodetic, HSM, Combined Action, Harsh Language, and Kornak. And again, just like with all the rotations here, after day four, the loot schedule begins again from day one. Again, feel free to refer to this calendar whenever you like. Now, jumping back to Lost Sector Rewards, and why I think doing Lost Sectors is so good this season, is number one, the guarantee 
NFT drop rates. Now for Legend Lost Sectors, the completion gives you a 70% chance to receive a weapon, but at Master, you have a guaranteed drop chance. Now keep in mind, you gotta get Platinum, but considering our builds, that should be no problem. Now on top of guaranteed loot, Master completions will also drop weapons with double perks, making the hunt for the God Roll a little bit easier. So I highly advise guys taking advantage of those Lost Sectors, especially Master Lost Sectors, to just give you a chance of getting that perfect roll. Now to take this an even step further, Master Lost Sectors are by far the best when it comes to farming for both Gunsmith Ingrams and these rural loot weapons. You see, over the course of five runs of Master Lost Sectors, we got six Gunsmith Ingrams, as well as six roll drops with double perks. This is literally a gameplay loop within itself that is the most efficient here, which is surprising because Bungie normally is like, yo, yeah, you want to optimize? Okay, go play Gambit. Now, Legend Lost Sectors are similarly rewarding. My folks that just want to do those. Across five Legendary Lost Sectors, though, we got two Gunsmith Ingrams and four Royal Drop weapons. Keep in mind, though, those Royal Drops are single perks, but Legend Lost Sectors is a lot easier. Now, comparing Gunsmith Ingram Drops across other activities, it's clear, and you can see here on the screen, guys, our runs and other activities, whether it was the Coil, Ribbon Slayer, Strikes, Gunsmith Ingram Drops are very low. Again, Bungie's change here is to try to incentivize you to run these Lost Sectors, and you're actually killing, like, three birds with one stone. You're getting Exotic to drop, you're getting Royal Loot, and you're getting Gunsmith Ingrams. Now, as far as the best builds to run these Lost Sectors, I'm gonna have three dim links down below, guys. One for each class, but again, this does change depending on the Master Lost Sector. But, these are builds that I find to be very useful, taking advantage of things like Surges, with decent survivability that I think many of you can just plug and go with. But again, feel free to really just build craft for yourself. And that's really the joy of Destiny, right? It's crafting a build that's unique to you. Now, with the farming completely out of the way, let's talk God Rolls. Let's start with Cantata. Now, things have actually changed since the first time this weapon was dropping. Most notably, the range changes, the decoupling of zoom, and of course, the nerf to rangefinder. You see, back in the day, I said that rangefinder was the perk to have on this handgun. However, now, if I had to choose, guys, time payload is really good for that extra flinch mid gunfight and that AoE damage. You can also rock opening shot for that bump in range and accuracy on that first shot. And as far as the best trait here in that first column, again, for PvP players, rapid hit or eye of the storm. Now, I will say rapid hit is really nice. You feel that stability bump up. And in the past, stability didn't matter as much on hand cannons. But just about all weapon types, even for mouse and keyboard players, stability has become more important. For my PvE players, time payload or Vorpal weapon. Completely up to you. I will say that payload perks, though, are great for overload champions. Next, we have Syncopation. This is actually a craftable weapon. One of my favorite adaptive pulse rifles in the game. It's Stasis. Nothing's really changed too much about the god roll for this one. I think Head Seeker Zen Moment or even Head Seeker Moving Targets are very good options. And for my PvE folks, you've got Frenzy, you've got Headstone, you've got Focus Fury, although I think Frenzy is just better than Focus Fury. Slap on Outlaw to combo with it and you'll be cooking. Next we have Fugu 55, a Void Adaptive Frame Sniper Rifle. Now it's already got what I love on sniper rifles in team environments. That being Firing Line and Fourth Times the Charm. And with that being said, this season is really incentivizing you to play solo. You've got solo dungeon runs. You've got solo operative. In this case, solo lost sectors. The biggest problem with firing line is that it doesn't proc when you're solo, which is why you may want to consider just getting a Vorpal roll, keeping a sniper like this, primarily when Void does rotate in as a search. For my PvP players, let me just be honest with you, nothing here is that great. You want to use an adaptive frame sniper rifle inside of PvP, use Beloved. Next, we have Staccato. This is a solar 180 round per minute scout rifle. Now, no lie, it actually has some good stuff. Incandescent, shoot to loot, explosive payload, dragonfly is also present here, triple tap, outlaw. As for PvP though, nothing here is really that crazy. But let's just be real, 180s really aren't that spicy inside of PvP, outside of a few with box breathing. This is definitely a PvE scout rifle, but one that I actually use often. Next on the list, we have Pizzicato, an adaptive frame kinetic SMG. Now, it's got a number of different trait combinations. Back in the day, I wanted that rangefinder roll, but again, rangefinder got nerfed. In this sandbox, I would actually take a threat detector fragile focus roll inside of PvP. Let fragile focus bump up a range by plus 20. Let threat detector proc when enemies are within 15 meters. That, to me, is a pretty good trait combination. Now, as for PvE players, there's nothing too crazy here. You know, if we had, like, demolitionist and a damage perk stacked on together, I could probably roll with that, but that's not present. Unless you're crazy about ensemble or maybe ambitious assassin, to me, this isn't really a strong PvE SMG. 
Next up, we have Fiatura 59. A really cool signer that I've personally used inside of PvE, primarily because of Repulsor Brace. I've got a Threat Detector Repulsor Brace role, and I've used it on and off inside of PvE in Void Surge environments, or if I was pairing it with a build like Gurf Falcons. Now, you can also utilize this inside of PvP. You've got Tunnel Vision and Kill Clip, both of which synergize very nicely together. You can rot Threat Detector and Moving Target, or Zim Moment Moving Target. Or if you're doing a melee combo, you can rush in with Swashbuckler, and get that times five. Being a rapid fire frame sidearm, I know they're not necessarily the most meta inside of PvP, but they are so fun to use. Now, moving on to our hockey weapons. We have the Palmyra Rocket Launcher. This is a craftable rocket launcher. It deals stasis damage, and it's got pretty much what you would want. And back in the day, we used to do Izanagi swap-offs with this rocket launcher. You could do like a lasting impression, auto-loading holster roll, impact casing. You can even throw on chill clip if you want. This is a hockey precision frame, so it does have built-in track but keep in mind, in comparison to like other legendary rocket launchers, Apex Predator, the Ghost of the Deep rocket launcher, Hothead, those rocket launchers are definitely much nastier. Next, we have Perseus D, a very interesting high impact stasis scout rifle. We've actually reviewed this one. Look, here's the thing about Perseus D. It's deceptive. You wouldn't expect it to feel as good as it does, but when you use it, you'll be surprised how well it handles its wants. It's got rapid hits, explosive payload, and that's pretty much the combination I would go for in inside of PvP. You don't really need opening shots. You've got plenty of range on this thing. Now for PvE players, headstone, shoot to loot. You could do a one for all, stats for all combo. And again, with this being a hockey weapon, it has that hockey breach armament origin trait, where the weapon deals increased damage against vehicles and constructs. That includes barricades, turrets, stasis crystals, and other objects created in the field. Next we have the Ragnahild D. This too is a craftable weapon. And again, with all these craftable weapons, by the way, guys, when you pick them up, you can apply those D deep side harmonizers and obtain the craftable role of these weapons. This is a solid shotgun, especially for my folks that are looking to squeeze out a little more damage, especially considering this is a kinetic weapon. Keep in mind, Bungie made a change where kinetic specials in particular deal more damage inside of PvE. And considering it's an aggressive frame, I actually used to use Ragnahild all the time in tandem with my one-two punch combo with my Strand Titan build. And you can do like an auto-loading holster, one-two punch, and then whatever mag perk you want. As for PvP players. Just use something else. Next up, we have Inyo D, a precision frame, kinetic SMG. Very similar to any of, albeit different roles. The god role for me, guys, for PvP players, maybe fragile focus and multi-kill clip, perhaps encore and multi-kill clip. I'm not really that crazy about Rampage being here, considering the mag size. But for my PvE players, you've got Vorp, which does 20% more damage inside of PvE against bosses and champions, as well as guardians in their super. You've got Surrounded. Throw on Feeding Frenzy, and Inyo D can serve you pretty well. Moving on, we have Budika. One of the most satisfying sidearms to shoot in Destiny. I don't know what it is about Budika. Puts out. For my PvP players, get that Swashbuckler. Moving target roll for those melee base builds. You've got Multi-Kill Clip also here. And considering this is a sidearm, Threat Detector could actually work really well for you. Now, for my PvE players, you've got One for All. You've got Stats for All. You've got Surrounded. You've got Threat Detector, which can also proc inside of PvE for you. You've got Frenzy. Your choice, guys. Again, there's nothing overwhelmingly special about Budika. It's just one of those weapons that oddly feels good to use. Next, we have Lodbrook. This is a high-impact auto rifle. Now, up until this season, Lodbrook was actually an option I would recommend for PvP players. I know 360s aren't that crazy, but that option of target lock dynamic sway is really good. You even got fragile focus on here if you wanted to bump that range to damn near max. You've also seen a few cascade point rolls, which allow Lodbrook to really blow its load. The problem is, is that there is an auto rifle that just came out from Iron Manor called Lethal Abundance. And the thing about Lethal Abundance is that it pretty much outclasses pretty much all 360 round per minute autos, at least in my opinion. Now you can still utilize this inside of PvE. It's a kinetic weapon. You could do that demolitionist adrenaline junkie roll. You can utilize target lock if you so wish. Kill clip is also present here. And this is a hockey weapon. So you can utilize this in certain activities with more efficiency. But again, Lethal Abundance for me is pretty much the king of 360s. Now moving on to our vice weapons. Let's start with crate. Now, considering this is a vice weapon and all of these are vice weapons, they come with the origin trait by Stinger. We're damaging an enemy with this weapon as a small chance to reload the magazine and increase movement speed while aiming down sights. Such a good origin trait. Now, this is a rapid fire auto rifle, meaning it's got those deep ammo reserves. You've got stats for all, one for all, overflow, plus vorpal, headstone. And for my PvP players, use something else. Next, we have redback. Oddly enough, another weapon that feels good to use. 
It's got opening shot, perpetual motion for my PvP players. Throw on max range, and you could be cooking. Stats for all, one for all, surround it. Now, would I use this sidearm over Drang inside of PvE, or even inside of PvP? Probably not, but it does have some good options. Next, we have Funnel Web. At one time, this was the strongest SMG in the game. Now, it's still good. With the right build, Funnel Web still does good damage. You've got Subsistence, you've got Frenzy, you've got Vice Stinger. That's still a great option. Now, for my PvP players, Forget about it, man. Listen, at one time, I used to rock this SMG inside of PvP, but it has really fallen off. And it's not really a fault of Funnel Web. It's really just the nerf to Rangefinder, the fact that we have such strong options out there, like Immortal, Ikelos, Unending Tempest, or even Shyurus Wrath. I would a thousand percent take those SMGs over Funnel Web now inside of PvP. Next, we have Luna Lada, a stasis lightweight bow. Now, it's got headstone and shoot the loot. And let me just say something about lightweight bows. At one time, I absolutely absolutely hated to use them inside of pretty much any activity, but they have become much better. They're more consistent. Bungie's improved the travel time of the arrow, making them more hit scanish. So something to consider, right? You've also got golden tricorn that's present on this weapon as well. Next, we have Taipan. Again, another weapon that at one time was literally the meta inside of PvE. This is a linear fusion rifle that you can, of course, craft. It's got firing line, fill prep, triple tap, clown cartridge. Again, I would just take triple tap with firing line any day, and that's actually the role that I still have. Moving on to our final vice weapon, Jiraka Raka. Look, man, nobody's that crazy about Jiraka Raka. And I really don't know why. A rapid fire vice weapon that has kill clip and rapid hits and a name like Jiraka Raka. Hell, fellas, what more do you want? As for my PvE players, you've got headstone, you got four times the charm, but again, you can still utilize rapid hit inside of PvE. Now, moving on to our Amalan weapons. We have Snorri, an extremely underrated fusion rifle that I personally use. And we get Get asked the same question every time we use this weapon. Cross, what fusion is that? This precision frame void fusion is very good. For my PvP players, you've got surplus, but again, ability cooldowns are getting increased cooldowns, most notably when we start shifting things to checkmates. So I'm not saying surplus isn't still good, but you may not have as many abilities on hand to take advantage of those benefits. That bonus to stability, handling, reload speed, all of which is tied to how many abilities you have up, which is why I really just like using firmly planet. Matter of fact, the role that I use is firmly planet, high impact reserves. Or you can use firmly planet, successful warm up. For my PvE players, you do have reservoir burst, but keep in mind, when it comes to the best void reservoir burst fusion rifle in the game, dude, it's Glacial Chasm all day long. And that's primarily because reservoir burst on Glacial Chasm can also roll with slide shot, which works beautifully. Next, we have Typhon GL5, a stasis heavy grenade launcher. Adaptive frame, by the way. And again, if you want to know what the PvP meta is for heavy weapons, it's adaptive heavy grenade launchers. No lie, they're the best. And that's primarily because Impulse Amplifier makes these weapons damn near hit scan. Throw on proximity grenades, Impulse Amplifier, and then that final column, use whatever you want. For my PvE player stuff, you've got Explosive Lights, you've got Demolitionist, and that's really the combo I would look at. I know Chill Clip is also present here, but if I was going to really try to utilize this weapon inside of PvE, it would probably be to maximize damage, right? Next we have Agma PR6. One of my my favorite pulse rifles in the game. Why? Well, number one, it's solo. And number two, it's got some good synergy perk combinations. I've got a Wellspring Demolitionist combo, which is nutty for ability cooldowns. And I've got a one for all stats for all combo. And I just swap between those two depending on what I'm doing. Now for my PvP players, please just use something else. Galu RR3, a surprisingly very good sniper rifle. Even though there's really nothing here on it that I would call meta for PvP. Dude, it just land shots. I don't know why. You've got snapshots and no distractions. Maybe slot in heating up to help with those multi kills. But outside of that, there's really nothing that crazy about it in PvP other than the sniper feels good to use. Again, I don't understand why. It just does. As for PvE players, nothing too crazy here. You do have golden tricorn, so maybe you can build into that 50% damage buff, but I find other sniper rifles to just be much better. Up next is one of the most popular auto rifles in Destiny history. The Amit AR2. This is a craftable weapon, and I utilize this weapon just as much in PvE as I did in PvP. For my PvP player stuff, dynamic sway, tap the trigger. You can do a gut shot straight roll that's enhanced, which doesn't hurt your target acquisition as much. It's also got that Amalan fluid dynamic origin trait, which helps with that stability at the top half of the magazine. Really, really good. Now for PvE players, I personally use stats for all in incandescent. I think incandescent's really good because it spreads that AoE damage on defeating that one target. This immediately procs stats for all, and I'm getting all those benefits. The increase in handling, reload, stability, and range. 
damage just for hitting three or more targets. Now, finally, we have the Aravando FR6. This is actually a fusion rifle that I'm not that familiar with. I did keep a few rolls. It's got reconstruction. It's got chill clip. Yes, I am curious to see what that synergy would be considering chill clip works on the top half of a magazine. So therefore, reconstruction should boost that ability to constantly be proccing. I know Riptide is like the go-to option for PvE players, primarily because it's a rabbit hit. The slow application works really well with that archetype. I need to look at Aaron Vando a little more. I need to see, can it hang or even compete against the likes of Riptide? Now for my PvP players, maybe Firmly Planet, Elemental Capacitor. I don't know, guys. This one's kind of up in the air for me because I just have not played with this fusion rifle. Now, moving on to our Lost Sector weapons. First on the list, we have Nox Perennial, one of the rarest weapons you could have gotten last season. It's a high impact strand fusion with some interesting roles. Envious Assassin, Controlled Burst. And keep in mind, this has the Origin Trait Wild Card, which lands these Telesto bolts on the ground after getting a final blow with this weapon. Kickstart is also present here. Under Pressure, Fragile Focus for that bump there in range. Lots of really good stuff, guys. I would definitely say more on the PvE side than even the PvP side, but a solid fusion rifle. Next, we have Old Sterling. This is an adaptive strand auto rifle. Has the origin trait field tested, which is such a good origin trait inside of PvE. There's actually a lot of good things present here. You've got Frenzy. You've got Rewind Rounds. You've got Demolitionist or even Hatchling. Now, as far as my PvP players, I'm not really that crazy about this in PvP. I know Surplus is present here, but there's really nothing in that final column outside of maybe a Adagio that's really going to help you out. Next, we have the Grenade Launcher Marcillion C. It's a hockey weapon, so of course it has hockey breach armaments. And at one time, we actually thought this Grenade Launcher was going to be craftable. Turns out it's not, but it's got some decent rolls. You got Envious Assassin, Incandescent, Explosive Light with Envious Assassin, Cascade Point if you're looking to blow your load, which by the way, I know it doesn't have the best total damage, but Cascade Point Rapid Fire Grenade Launchers has incredible DPS. For my PvP players, don't use it. Rapid fires are garbage. Next, we have Sununa. This is a Stasis Amelon sidearm, which uniquely has the perk Headseeker. Now, unfortunately, there's really nothing else in the first column that's helping you out, unless you just want to kill your target acquisition with Slick Draw. Maybe you want to rock under pressure. But the reason why I bring up Headseeker is that this sidearm and the Europa sidearm, at least off the top of my head, are the only sidearms that can rock Headseeker. And considering this is a burst fire weapon, Headseeker is a perk you could take advantage of on this sidearm if you wanted to go that route. Outside of that, though, for PvE players, Headstone, Envious Assassin, or even a Grave Robber Headstone combo. You could throw on Golden Tricorn if you so wish, with maybe Feeding Frenzy. All of those will serve you well. Next, we have Psy Hermetic 5. Again, one of the rarest pulse rifles, or at least it was at one time. Personally, I love this pulse. Now, I do think that Messenger does slightly edge it out if you have the God Roll, but that's the thing. If you've got the God Roll. If not, Hermetic is fantastic. Headseeker, moving targets, get a high range roll, try to max out that recoil direction and guys you'll be extremely impressed with this pulse rifle now keep in mind inside of pve pulse rifles got a buff and we also have stasis surge this season so with the wild card origin trait here you've got a stasis pulse rifle that even though this is not an archetype that i'm not a big fan of inside of pve you can utilize a golden tricorn frenzy headstone combination with either outlaw or even in line action next we have glissando a strand 180 round per minute scout rifle guys we reviewed this one and it's good keep away box breathing all day long for pvp you'll get that extremely fast ttk value of 0.67 which sneaks up on a lot of people and i actually find the reticle on this weapon and its target acquisition to be very good on par with hung jury now for my pve players you've got hatchling you got one for all you've got overflow or even reconstruction but keep in mind it's a primary weapon and unless you're rocking like double primary you're probably gonna have this weapon out majority of the time next we have iru kanji guys i try to use this sniper rifle inside of pvp i got the under pressure opening shot roll i was like yo this is it i've got double the accuracy here's the problem and i'm not sure if it's because it's a vice weapon or a rapid fire frame all i know is that it can't handle flinch worth a damn and then when i would like slide into engagements i noticed there was just a lot of reticle shape almost reminded me of like year one d2 so all i'm gonna say is that for pvp it's a no-go now for pve players you can use this and i guess it's pretty good considering when stasis surge is active you've also got by stinger you've got firing line envious assassin or fourth times the charm all those would work really well for you now outside of surge environments supremacy is king and honestly i still feel like supremacy is still king considering just how easy it is to proc bait and switch next
Next we have Nas Red. This is a sword that has the origin trait field tested, which actually increases charge rate for your swords upon defeating targets. Now, here's the thing about swords. They have gotten a lot better. I think in terms of the sword meta, you've got Lament, you've got Bequest, now even some Heart Shadow rolls, some craftable swords like Gold Tusk. Nas Red in here has got a lot of competition. You can rock a relentless surrounded combination if you can keep surrounded procced, which is really nice. But again, the moment you can proc surround it, you lose that 35% damage buff. Next we have Heliocentric. A really good sidearm, guys. It comes with the origin trait Nadir Focus. Sustained fire increases accuracy and range. Now we haven't actually broken down everything about this, especially in terms of like accuracy cone size. D2 Foundry has it listed that it increases range up by 10, but this weapon has a lot of great combinations. Kill clip, moving target, perpetual motion. For my PvE players, incandescent, heal clip. But you know, no one's that crazy about heal clip, but it may be something to consider here. Surrounded is also present here and that adrenaline junkie demolitionist combo. Next we have Last Foray. This is an aggressive frame solar sniper rifle with field tested. I actually have not used this. I know it's got envious assassin here. It's got focus fury. Cascade point is also present. So is incandescent. There's definitely nothing here that screams to me this would be good inside of PvP. PV, it does have some potential. And when I look at like PvE sniper rifles that are solar, outside of like Azumi or OG Azumi, I really don't have anything. Maybe Ikelos? So there is a void here to be filled. And maybe Last Foray can do that. Moving on, we have Hand in Hand. That's right. That shotgun that many of us used to use back when it was just a green. Yeah, it was good. Used to be like one of my most used shotguns and it was a green weapon. But it has returned to us with traits. It's an aggressive frame here. It's got slide shot and that's pretty much it for PvP. Maybe you could do like Elemental Capacitor with an Arc subclass to really bump up that handling, but there's really nothing else outside of just swapping out Slide Shot for Fragile Focus, which would be good. But again, the first column loaded down with good stuff. The second column, not so much. For my PvE players, you've got one-two punch. Granted, I do prefer one-two punch on craftable shotguns, simply because you don't have to land all the pellets. But you do have Cascade, which is an interesting one considering this is an aggressive frame shotgun. And after getting a kill, the rate of fire already increases. So the question I have is how crazy can we get here? You've got Cascade, you get a kill with aggressive frame. I mean, how much load blowing can we do? Unfortunately, we don't have anything in that first trait column, like maybe Envious Assassin or something that would boost our max size. So blow thy load you can, but at four rounds in a base magazine, you won't be blowing that long. Next we have Battle Scar, a very good kinetic pulse rifle in the lightweight frame archetype. Even though lightweight frames aren't that great, I feel like Battle Scar can somewhat hang. Head Seeker, keep away a great PvP combination. And for my PvE players, you've got Kinetic Tremors, got Shoot the Loot, and that's pretty much it. But it's still good considering you've got Field Tested as the origin traits. I really like Kinetic Tremors on Battle Scar, guys, and I would highly advise getting one of these rolls. Now, moving on to Geodetic HSM. Another sword, but with the origin trait Nadir Focus. Now, this one's interesting because it has Destabilizing Rounds and Repulsor Brace Combo, which is two traits that can really build off of each other. That's a really cool combination here, guys. Very intriguing. I know it's not necessarily something that's going to like amp up the lethality of the sword itself, but the synergy that it provides for Void 3.0 builds and the ammo economy that swords have, this would be a very fun option to use. Next on the list, we have Combined Action, an aggressive frame arc hand cannon that actually has some really good perk combinations if you can get them. Zim Moment, Kill Clip, Tunnel Vision, Kill Clip, Run Around, get those two taps. For my PvE players, you've got Bolt Shots, and that's about it. There's really nothing in that first column that's helping you with your flat reload speed. Now, you do have Eddie Curry. Which again, if you're leaning to arc 3.0 and bolt shots, you can utilize those two together as Eddie Current does increase reload speed after sprinting, but the effect is improved when you are amplified. Now, I know you're jumping through a lot of hoops, but the beautiful thing about this is that that is pretty easy to achieve on arc 3.0 and something you could definitely do here with combined action. Next on the list is one of the best weapons you can get in the rule loophole, Harsh Language. This is a void waveframe grenade launcher. It's got combinations like destabilizing rounds in envious assassin which is actually the combination I have. You do have Disruption Break, which I advise all the time for my players inside of PvP. It's a great way to debuff targets, to then follow up and swap to a kinetic weapon to do increased damage. Now, you don't have any like auto-loading perks here in that first trait column, but you do have things like Threat Detector you can utilize inside of PvP. But for my PvE players, I think Stats for All is really easy to proc considering it's a wave frame. Envy's Assassin is pretty good as well. And of course, Field Prep just to help with ammo con. Now, finally, we have the Koronak 
Mark 22. This is a 600 round per minute solar auto rifle. It's got some pretty good rolls, guys. Feeding Frenzy, Incandescent, Envious Assassin is also present here. As for my PvP players, I have not used this inside of PvP, but it does have target lock. It also has Zim moments. And again, target lock doesn't necessarily shift the TTK values of your weapons, but it does add some level of forgiveness. And it may be worth looking at on Coronac. So guys, that is all of the weapons you can get in the rule loop pool through the gunsmith and through lost sectors. Now this takes us to the four weapons you cannot get. The four that are only rule loot drops this season. One is the Ross Araga or Araga. The other one is the Parabellum, the Marcado, and Crux Termination. Now I'm going to start with Crux Termination. It's got Envious Assassin and Bipod. It's also in the aggressive frame archetype. Interesting combination, which allows you to shoot off a ton of rockets at once. You've also got Clown Cartridge here. A lot of intriguing things that I really just need to sit down and damage test with. Next, we have Marcado, a Strand Adaptive Frame Machine Gun, and it has some juicy perks. You've got Slice, you've got Onslaught, and by the way, Slice is a great trait for the season because it synergizes with so many artifact mods. Most notably, Torch, which increases the damage of our weapons when applying a Stasis or Strand debuff, which is extremely easy to do with something like Slice. That would definitely be the combination I would look for on that machine gun. Next, we have Parabellum, an Adaptive Frame SMG. Almost looks like Last Exit, right? Nothing really blows me away inside of PvP. You've got Dynamic Sway in that final column, and that's pretty much it. For my PvE players, you've got Feeding Frenzy and Rewind Routes. And then finally, we have Ross Araga, a gun model you've seen multiple times, but I actually like. Wild Card is the origin trait on this one. And you've got Subsistence, Golden Tricorn, Onslaught, which is exactly what I would go for. You can imagine like in a Void Surge environment, something like Subsistence or even Rewind Rounds with Onslaught, with Actium War Rig. Ah, this one should serve you well. So again, guys, those four weapons are not available from the Gunsmith or from Lost Sectors, but they will be farmable next season. Well, fellas and ladies, thank you all for coming and watching. And as always, slap that like button like your mama told you right.